Good evening. I think we may be welcoming some more people after we start, but we just decided to try to start pretty close to on time, and we'll do that after this. I know some people have trouble finding parking and so on, so you'll know what it's like um, now that you've been here at least once. My name is Linda Gillison, and I have the joy. Uh, just about every year, they tried an alternative form one year, and I'll tell you why I'm sure I'm back this year doing the introductions uh, and it's a real joy for me because I get to hear six wonderful lecturers and, and meet people from the community and just hear excellent conversation about important topics every year at this time of year talk about the bleak midwinter that was this afternoon wasn't it uh, first I'm going to ask you if you haven't yet turned off your cell phones to please do so and I'm, as you know, welcoming you to the 14th Annual uh, Alumni Association Community Lecture Series. I believe that one of the women who was uh, sort of one of the crafters of this series is here. Kitty Robbins is here. Um, and Boone is away someplace where it's warm, I believe. She'll come back in a few weeks. <laughs> But, but she planned for us while she was gone, so that was that was good. Um, so I'm just going to, the reason I'm always asked back is because I give short introductions, and I'm sure that that's actually the clue to the whole thing. I don't, do want to remind you, though, that at the end of the series, on the last night of the series, the lecture and question and answer will be followed by a wine and cheese party. So uh, that's always a lot of fun. We'll get to meet all of the lecturers. Um, our lecturer for tonight is Professor Dane Scott. Uh, my job is made particularly easy by the fact that he's put his information up here. <laughs> Thanks, Dane. Um, Dane is a director of the Mansfield Ethics and Public Affairs program here on campus. He works in the, in the College of Forestry and Conservation. We're getting longer and longer names here as things come along. And he particularly researches ethical issues in science and in technology. I asked all of the lecturers to tell me something about themselves that probably other people didn't know and that they wouldn't mind sharing with 250 intimate friends. And also, how they got involved in social justice and issues of an ethical approach to this kind of this kind of question and so on. Uh, Dane told me one thing in strictest confidence, which I see he's also put in the printed program. So Dane, this was not helpful. <laughs> is that? But but I do think it is kind of an interesting thing that Dane. Um, took on the task of becoming a doctor of philosophy, having started his undergraduate degree with a degree in soil science. And he believes he's actually one of the few people who's ever taken that career path. So if you know others, do let us know. Um, he also told me that he was born in a Hopi Indian reservation and that his dad was a teacher there. Um, and that his real interest in teaching ethics has to do with his training in philosophy, although I suspect that there might have been some of that from, uh, from the Hopi Indian Reservation um, also. So with that, I'm just going to introduce Professor Dane Scott to you. He, he Listen, because he'll be making a couple of little introductory remarks or references to our other lecturers. Um, and then at the end, of course, we'll have our usual question and answer. Uh, Professor Scott? Well, thank you. It's, a, it's a very much of an honor to be here, and I recognize a lot of friends from Molly classes. And a lot of this will be a review for our latest justice class, and so we'll go over that quickly. Um, also, I am really proud and honored to uh, teach at the University of Montana in the ethics, uh, general education requirements. So I always cover ethics and theories of ethics in those classes. And I hope tonight's talk is a little bit of a justification of why that is important. Um, so I probably, I'm going to try to get done in 60 minutes, but it, I just couldn't condense all I wanted to say. So we're going to have to uh, see if I can pull it off. So I am talking about social justice. And the question is, well, what is it? Uh, and I think uh, Glenn Beck said it's the forced redistribution of wealth. Uh, um, but I, I think most of us think it's extremely important. Uh, but it's hard to actually put our handle on what it is. So in order to answer the second question, which is the topic of my uh, talk here, is can emerging technologies promote social justice by finding solutions to difficult global problems? And I think we face... Uh, you know, I was talking to Professor Albert Borgman, and he thinks 
global ethics is one of the issues that we will be facing in the 21st century. And so can technology play a role in solving some of those issues? Well, right here is a picture of the American mind. Uh, it's a Rube Goldberg machine. If that was uh, Ron Paul, it would look a little different. Um, it, it would be much simpler. Uh, we have up in our heads part of our DNA, if you would, of, of the American mind, are a lot of different ethical theories uh, from a lot of different sources, from secular sources, from religious sources, and how we put it all together in this sort of confusion when we address social justice issues isn't always pretty. It kind of looks like this Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, we have ideas of maximizing utility, right? Ideas of individual liberty, of human rights, promoting virtues. All of those things are in most of our minds when we come up and think about social justice. Um, just to kind of illustrate that, I have a short vi YouTube video, thanks to the wonders of the internet. Uh, The trolley problem. Runaway trolley. Four men in its path. All of them will die. But wait, you can pull a lever. You can change the trolley's course to another track where only one man stands. You have a choice. Kill one or let four die. What are you going to do? Um, I'll pull it. I'd pull the lever and divert the train. Yes, I would absolutely pull the switch. Most people say yes, that's a morally right thing to do because what you're doing is essentially the utilitarian thing. That means having one person die isn't as bad as having four people die. Absolutely. You're saving four lives. There's another equivalent scenario. Same situation. Runaway trolley. Four men will die. But this time you're on a bridge. And there's a man there. He's fat. Fat enough to stop the trolley and save the four men. But he won't jump. He'll need to be pushed. Can you push the man over the edge? I don't think that would be a possibility at all. And I don't think this would be justified. I can't do that. Most people say, no, that's not an appropriate thing to do. This is a real mystery because the outcomes are the same. If all you really care about is what is the consequences of your action, you should feel morally at ease with pushing the person off the bridge if you felt at ease with flipping the switch before. So the point of the trolley problem, philosophers, of course, use these little sort of dilemmas to sort of illustrate the conflicts that we have. I was saying we have this little Rube Goldberg machine in our heads. And I think there's conflicts here between the sort of utilitarian sort of calculus of doing the best by the greatest number of people and the sort of the ideas that people have rights. They have dignity. And we shouldn't use people, no matter how large they are, for things to stop trains, right? It's a violation of, of their rights as a person. And we're uncomfortable with these things, and, and we end up with these conflicting ideas within our sort of moral framework when we make decisions about things. And this is what I think is going on. We're in a, the midst of a great philosophical debate, as we know from the president's budget, about the distribution of wealth in our society. And some people think that the, the distribution is very unfair, unjust. It does not promote social justice while other people have a different conception of social justice, is that which keeps the government out of your business, right? So you, know, you can sort of see these competing ideas on social justice, on what is the just society at work in our society. So uh, as a philosophy professor in these classes and as part of the general education requirement, we cover the main sort of philosophical theories on social justice. 
And like I'm saying, I think these are part of our DNA, part of our culture, and form the framework for much of our discussions, just like the trolley problem. So if we were to ask a utilitarian about whether or not the current disparity in wealth uh, is just, they would say, well, does it maximize happiness, right? The utilitarian sort of conceive of human beings as maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. That's sort of the ends of life. And our policy should reflect that. The libertarian will, did it arise without fraud or, or force? I mean, did things happen legitimately? And so they'd like people to be free to pursue their own interests. And it's only illegitimate if there was some sort of fraud. It was, it was foul play, if you would. Uh, then the free market, you would normally think of that as an ethical theory, but it is. Uh, and it's, were the markets free, and if they are, then they would automatically lead to welfare. And then the liberal, or Rawlsian, John Rawls as a philosopher, would ask, well, does it benefit the least well-off in a society? Rawls will say there can be differences in a society, but only if it benefits those that are not doing very well. And then the virtue theorist is, does it pronounce the good or the just society? And we'll talk a little bit, very briefly, about these. Um, Jeremy Bentham was the founder of utilitarianism. And his idea was he wanted to bring ethics you know, down into a scientific discipline. right? And so he did that to remove all the religious and sort of mystical things. And he just took us down to pleasure and pain. And he doesn't look at moral principles. You look at the way the world is. right? So that's how the, in the trolley problem. Uh, they were thinking, right? Four people versus one person, well, easy choice. The consequences of our action mean four people live, one dies, no problem. Pull the lever, right? Um, so we ought to do that, which increases the overall happiness. Because as human agents or human beings acting in the world, we seek pleasure, we avoid pain. So the goal is to maximize that. Well, this led him to some odd things. Uh, because utilitarians don't really respect individual rights, as we saw by pushing the guy off the track, right? Uh, and so he felt that beggars, because they sort of uh, were unpleasant and they created a lot of displeasure among people, well, they should be removed off the street and put in poorhouses because the, you know, the pleasure that would be gained by the mass of society would outweigh the discomfort of being put in a poorhouse. So while utilitarianism has done a great bit for our society, there is this problem of individual rights, as we saw in the trolley problem. So he called naturalites nonsense on stilts. Um, so the other problem with it, you have to find a common currency. If you're going to do these great calculations, the greatest good for the greatest number, you have to have a unit of measure. What are you going to measure if you're going to do this calculation to find out the greatest good? right? And so it, it, it requires this difficulty of finding a single unit that can be spread across society. Right. Um, the next one, and this is going to be a whirlwind tour, so, is the libertarian. And this is Robert Nozak, a Harvard philosopher, one of the two Harvard philosophers to appear in this sort of a tour. Uh, is he writes here something I think most of us would agree with. In other words, I think many of these philosophies have fundamental insights that we find very attractive. Uh, he says, a person's life, uh, a person's shaping of his life in accordance with an overall plan is his way of giving meaning to his or her life only a being with the capacity to, to so shape his life can or strive for a meaningful life, right? So the general idea here is that we don't want people telling us what to do, right? I think my daughter was a bit of a libertarian when she was a little kid, right? Very little. She said, you know, I want to do it. Right? You know, there was no hope of her pulling this off. Right? She just couldn't do it. She was too little. But she wanted to do it herself. Right? And uh, so there are some problems, though. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the ideas here, though, is if we're answering the question, is the current distribution of wealth unjust? Well, we would ask, well, how did it arise? They have a sort of historical principle of entitlement. You're entitled to it if you got it fairly. Right, if you went out and, and, and you merited on your own. The other things is, I think you've heard these mottos for no paternalism. We don't want the government telling us what to do, because that would interfere with our individual liberty, our, our right to determine our own life. And no legislating morality, and no redistribution of wealth. And then, of course, John Stuart Mill's principle of no harm. Your liberty is yours as long as you're not harming other people. Right? 
Um, now, there are some problems. These penguins over here, this flock of penguins, and we have one in the back singing, I gotta be me. Right? <laughs> so there is a little bit something, you know, we do owe a lot to society. And I think the libertarian sort of view of things doesn't take into account how much our debt to other people we owe. Uh, so we owe debts to those who contribute to our liberty, and we are not wholly responsible for our own successes. Um, now, we've all been watching the uh, Republican debates for a long time, so I don't need to dwell on market theory for very long. Uh, it's been talked about. Uh, but there, it, is a, it is an ethical theory, and oddly enough, we have a, a, an odd combination in this ethical theory. And that is, we have this sort of libertarian tendency of not being interfered with, combined with this utilitarian sort of goal of maximizing welfare. You wouldn't think these things would go together. But they do go together and form this theory that says, as we pursue you know, our own benefits, everybody will be the better off. Well, it does appeal to a couple of things that we all like, right? Uh, in those insights of freedom from libertarianism and the welfare from utilitarianism. But it does have some problems, that market choices are not always free. Uh, and in the case to the right here, you have this example of surrogate pregnancy in India. you know. You could, uh, in Europe and other places, they are hiring women in India to carry children for them to term. Now, are these women in an economic position that they're making a free exchange? Right. And is it the case that certain goods should just be left out of the market? Right. So those are just a couple of the problems. Uh, John Rawls, our second Harvard philosopher, um, he wrote a, a very famous and influential book, at least in academia, on justice. And his conception of justice is he recognized that life is not fair, right? That where we are, our position in life, the advantages we have, we really didn't do anything to merit those advantages. The fact that you went to the university or the fact that you inherited funds or many of the benefits in life we don't really deserve. Uh, and oftentimes we structure our society uh, around the fact that we prejudice toward ourselves, right? That we might do well. So he says, well, we should, you know, if we're going to make a social contract and we're going to organize society, it should be done fairly. And so he comes up with this idea of a veil of ignorance. It's a thought experiment where we imagine that we are, don't know our position in society, don't, whether we're, don't know whether we're going to be male or female, rich or poor, what race we'll be involved with or anything, right? We don't have knowledge about our position in society. And given that, what sort of principles would we choose to govern society? He thinks we play it safe. He thinks that the logical and sell the way to, to go about this is to choose a position in society or choose laws that govern a society where the least well off in a society is the best off. In other words, we're going to play it safe in the kind of society that we create. So he would allow for differences in a society, but only if they benefit those in the society that are at the least advantage. Right? And he thinks that's the logical thing for people to do in order to play it safe. So, you know, we can ask, if we had time, if you, we were in my class, we'd start discussing this at this point. Uh, is, is Mark Zuckerberg's $36 billion justified in relationship to algebra teacher, uh, she won the Teacher of the Year in Florida, Yolanda Whitehead? In other words, which one of these people is making society better off? making the least well off, right? <coughs> now, he would allow, right, for the inventive, inventiveness to encourage innovation that people like Zuckerberg could potentially become very wealthy because we might all benefit from that. But on the other hand, maybe we're undervaluing, right, the algebra teacher and their benefit to the least well off in society. So there are some problems. It is the one that jumps to mind is motivation, right? If we want to encourage people to be innovative, to motivate, to make society better, we might want to reward them for it. Right? Uh, but Rawls says, well, you know, he does give allowance for that. Uh, and justice about creating expectations and entitlements. So those are sort of the clashing ideas. And they should be mostly familiar with you, maybe with not the sort of philosophical jargon I've been using. But you should sort of recognize these ideas bouncing around in your head. And they form or frame the debate that we have over social justice. Um, now, the last one is uh, another, I have another video, 
uh, which talks about creating a good or just society. A pot of hazelnuts and the flint that's needed to open the lid. Ted gives Vulcan a white chip, which can be exchanged for food, in this case, a dried biscuit. An identical token for Virgil, but in return, he gets a juicy grape, a far better exchange. Virgil is back for seconds, but this time Vulcan sees him get the grape. He now expects one too. <laughs> Biscuit? That's not fair. <laughs> Virgil's back again. Another grape. Vulcan is losing his composure. This injustice is too much. He was happy with Biscuit, but that was before Virgil got grapes. Now he'd sooner have nothing than be shortchanged. It's a point of principle. Well, I think this is probably one of the most obvious conceptions of justice, people getting what's fair and what they deserve, right? Uh, and obviously within these, uh, this is Aristotle's definition, equals should be treated equally, and unequals should be treated, une treated unequally. And, you know, there, there's a little story I heard. I went to Santa Barbara recently to my brother-in-law's 50th birthday, right? And here they were, you know, all the family was gathered together, and they were telling stories about each other, you know, as they do. And they were, uh, when Leslie, my wife, and her brother Jeff were young, uh, they were going to go get some money to the gumball machine, right? Uh, their mom gave them a penny to go to the gumball machine. And the, the, the brother, Jeff, starts yelling, Leslie's penny is bigger than mine. <laughs> the kind of a perception problem. Well, it made me wonder. And I was sitting there wondering what was going on. And I recalled back that uh, Leslie's mom had given all the boys in Leslie a video of their childhood growing up. And so after receiving it in Christmas, Jeff calls up Leslie and said, it was nice mom gave me a video of you, you know, for Christmas. Right? <laughs> Apparently, you know, most of the video footage was devoted to Leslie. Now, Leslie was really cute, and I can understand that. But I think uh, Leslie's mom had the right principle of justice, but maybe, you know, equal give them an each a penny, but it might not have been applied consistently. Uh, and so the culture, now it's hard. We all know as raising kids, as being in workplaces, that it does require a sort of judgment to give everybody what they deserve. It's a difficult thing to do. But we also know from the, the monkeys that creating justice, giving people what they deserve, makes people happy. Right? It creates a good environment, a good society. So this sort of virtue of justice, this ability to judge when people are getting what they deserve, is what helps create a good society. Uh, but we get it by habits. And it goes all the way back to Aristotle, right, and his notion of the virtues. And the virtue of justice is social. Uh, we are social animals like monkeys. Uh, and it requires good judgment. It's not easy to do. As parents, perhaps you can recall how hard it might have been to treat everybody uh, fairly. Uh, for Aristotle, the purpose, though, of politics is to form, a, to form good citizens and to cultivate good character. 
So the end and purpose of political life is the good life. The institutions of social life are a means to that end. Well, there are some problems with this, of course. It all makes sense, but uh, laws are not neutral. We tend to want to think that laws should not sort of force morality, although they are, in a sense, based in ethical theories. Uh, and who gets to decide which virtues are honored or rewarded? I, I recall this uh, scene from the film uh, Gladiator, where Marcus Aurelius, who was a philosopher and wrote books on the virtues, his son says, well, I read your books on virtues, and none of your virtues were my virtues. But I do have virtues, right? I have the virtue of ambition. So who gets to decide you know, in a society? Well, we do, I suppose. So if I ask, what is social justice? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. But I don't think that leaves us in despair. I think we can get together as members of democratic societies, and we have the ability to deliberate together about the relationship between our favorite theory of justice, uh, conceptions of justice, our shared goals, and how we reach those goals in light of our best knowledge of the world. Right? So all this, uh, now you have your recertified. For all you UM alum who went back and you had your general education requirement, you've gone through and you're recertified. Okay, so moving on to my other topic. Um, can emerging technologies promote social justice by finding solutions to difficult global problems? And the second related question, I think, is uh, what is the relationship between our conceptions of social justice, social goals, and scientific research and technological development? Uh, how many of you guys have probably heard of Freeman Dyson? He won the Nobel Prize. He's a physicist, public intellectual. He likes to rattle the cage. <laughs> he, he is a contrarian. And uh, he came out oh, a couple years ago, I think in 2010, with a contrarian essay in the New York Review of Books on Climate Change. But he, he asked the question, I think it's a very serious question. I'm looking for ways in which technology may contribute to social justice. Uh, to the alleviation of the differences between rich and poor, of the preservation of the earth. And he wrote this book, um, which I, th I found interesting, uh, called The Sun, the Genome, and the Internet. And he's arguing that we have the tools. We have the tools to solve many of these global problems that we face, some serious social justice issues. And those uh, issues are the sun, where we will get energy, the genome, our, our ability to manipulate genetic engineering, uh, or to manipulate DNA molecules, and the internet to control information. Um, can everybody hear me? Are you good? Okay. Um, so he says, I'm not saying that technology drives, I says, I am saying technology drives eth ethics. I'm saying that poverty can be reduced by a combination of solar energy, genetic engineering, and the internet. And perhaps when poverty, there's this connection between population growth, stops increasing, the population will stop exploding. So that's his theory. I'm saying the opposite, by the way. Uh, ethics drives science and technology. Although there are nuances here. <laughs> and much to be used. So we all know, anybody who knows history or familiar with the polio epidemic, that science and technology can promote and often does promote social justice. Uh, we had this horrific scare of polio uh, where you know parents were afraid to send their kids out. And we had, it wasn't prejudice toward the rich. This technology helped everybody. Uh, we can find other examples, clean water, sewage treatment, vaccinations, antibiotics. So we have a lot of indications, but the record is mixed. And in fact, we know there is a reaction against science and technology. So a lot of parents are refusing, not a lot, but a significant number are refusing to have their kids vaccinated. There's sort of a suspicion of science and technology, a bit of a backlash that it's not leading to a good society. And we get images of this in our popular culture. Uh, if you look for sort of optimistic views of science and technology, they're actually kind of hard to find. Uh, Star Trek is one. And in fact, through science and technology and reason, uh, we've created a world where we have to go to other planets to find conflict <laughs> and go out into the universe. But normally you get things like uh, Blade Runner, where we end up with a dark, dystopian world filled with acid rain and full of poverty. Uh, and, and we end up with technology generating uh, 
difficult moral quandaries like creating cyborgs or robots that may be human. We might have a difficult time uh, killing them. So there's two views of technology. We, but at the same time, we might we tend to invest in the one on the left, but the one on the right captures our imagination. So we have a very ambiguous relationship. One technological pessimist was Garrett Hardin, who used notions from biology to wonder about these issues of justice and where we're headed. And he used the notion of caring capacity as an ethical norm. And as a good population biologist, he knew that you just can't keep growing in population, that there's a limit of energy on the Earth, and we can't let population get out of hand. It has a specific caring capacity. And so he thinks of this notion of like a lifeboat. And what we're actually doing with technology is we're just artificially increasing the size of the lifeboat to let more people into the lifeboat. But ultimately, it's just going to be crowded, degraded, and that's going to be, you know, we're just headed nowhere. And he doesn't think that this population problem actually has a technological solution. So in his view, he's not optimistic that technology can promote social justice. And he is a utilitarian, by the way. He just changes Bentham's formula to the greatest good for the optimum number. Now, the problem is, though, with population and all of these global problems that I said we would be speaking of that we are facing in the 21st century, and there are serious problems, climate change, global health, and world hunger. And all of them deal with population. So we have this sort of graph. When I was first started you know, college, all the graphs never leveled off, right? They all just went straight up into catastrophe, right? <laughs> Uh, and, but here we have it leveling off. And one asks, well, why? You know, why is population leveling off? Well, we look at the developed world, and population has leveled off. And so it, the conclusion is that poverty, in many complicated ways, is a driver of population growth. So if we could somehow alleviate poverty, we could then slow population growth, and it would level off. The problem is that do we have time? For example, in the problem of climate change, you know, India has three times as many people, or two times as many people, in poverty as, uh, as live in the United States. So if those folks are trying to you know, get a decent living to remove themselves from poverty, that's going to work against solving the problem of global climate change if they start burning coal and other fuel. And India has an equal amount of people that live in the United States that are in poverty. So one of the things is, well, how do we allow countries, or how can countries develop, uh, while not making the global climate change work, and just end up in a very uh, sort of hot, crowded, and to quote a book, uh, world that's highly impoverished. And one of the things is, well, global health. Health is also a driver of poverty. Um, and world hunger, agricultural production. Can we grow enough food for this to happen? So there might be hope. We might not be in Garrett Hardin's sort of, which to me is a very troubling scenario for social justice. Uh, how can we sort of get there? And I think technology, at least in my opinion, will have to play an important role. And we have a lot of powerful technologies. And I don't go all the way with Freeman Dyson. And I'm not an uncautious or or uh, un sort of critical booster of science and technology. But I do think that we have some powerful tools at our disposal. And how do we use those tools to sort of get where we need to be in terms of uh, population, poverty, and the, and the planet? Well, some of these things are, we talked about genetic engineering, the ability to manipulate the DNA molecule to produce things that we would like to help us do better. And nanotechnology, the ability to engineer at the micro level, the 10 or nano level, uh, 10 to the minus 9th meter, and things like uh, energy technology. Well, DNA, I mean, uh, genetic engineering is the one I wanted to focus on just a little bit. And this is, for those of you I'm sure everybody is familiar with, but they can do amazing things, right? We always wanted uh, to, we were fascinated by what we could do with spider silk, this amazing substance. You can't get it from spiders very easily. Uh, well, you can. What they did is they took the gene that produced the protein 
that created the spider silk and put it into the DNA of a goat. And so when you milk the goat, that protein is there, and then you can extract it, and you can get spider silk, right? So it's a powerful technology, um, but disturbing. <laughs> uh, well, back to my talk. Is there are not only technological pessimists, but also a lot of optimists. And uh, one of the most thoughtful, I think, was Alvin Weinberg, who was uh, for years and years ran the uh, Oak Ridge Nuclear Laboratory. And he wrote books and thought about science, technology, and society. And he actually coined some very important terms. One is big science, and the other one is technological fix. And the other one was a Faustian bargain, talking about nuclear energy. So he said society would hardly survive more than many generations without the fantastic developments that have come out of big science. The whole future of our society depends on the continued success of science and technology. Again, this is a controversial topic, and, and we are of two minds now about the role of science in society, but not Weinberg. I mean, uh, and again, what he was talking about with big science was something like the Genome Project, where you have this large coordinated effort of scientists aimed at solving one problem. Or we could talk about, as last week we had a speaker talking about geoengineering, a technological fix. We politically can't seem to solve the problem of climate change, so you could get teams of scientists working on solving it technologically, sort of moving around the social, um, the social and political problems that we don't seem to be able to solve. All of this was utilitarian. I, as you know, Gifford Pinchot, the, uh, the founder of the Forest Service, guided Forest Service policy on utilitarian principles, the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest period of time. And this did much good. Before Pinchot took over, you know, it was the rich enriching themselves from our natural resources. And the same with big science. So in agricultural research, it has been utilitarian. And it has been governed by big science since World War II. And so you get this idea of, well, what is the unit of utility that they're using? And it's production. So if you're a scientist for many years working in agricultural research, one of your goals was to increase agricultural production. And that is a utilitarian benefit for society because it increases food. And we owe a lot to that. Or the low cost that we're paying for food is due to this great effort of big science to increase yields. And one of the people that is most famous for doing this is Norman Burlock, who in the 70s developed dwarf wheat. And India was on the verge of you know, mass famine, constantly on the verge, that they just couldn't feed the population in the country. And this technology was imported to India. And now India is capable of feeding itself. You get this graph here of the beginning of the Green Revolution. And then you see how yields rise until today when they're stagnant. So all the benefits, that technology is leveled off. And we're not getting many more benefits of it. And the other thing is it came with severe cost. If you're solely focused on production, you miss a lot of other important things. And so as, you're worried, as you know, there's a loss of bio, uh, biodiversity associated with industrial agriculture, soil erosion, air pollution, aquifer depletion, uh, and human health. Right? All kinds of sort of things that weren't figured in into this very narrow view, of utilitarian view, of increasing production. Well, Borlaug, the last couple of decades of his life, was a champion of biotechnology because he felt that well, all of the problems that we created with the uh, Green Revolution and industrial agriculture might be able to be solved with another technology. Right? Uh, and he felt that that was what, it was what was going to be the next big thing. The other sort of problem we see that with productionism and the sort of utilitarian philosophy that was driving the technology, we ended up with another problem. And many of you that grew up in rural communities around the United States know that they're not what they used to be. The rural communities and small farms have been hit very, very hard. And a lot of this was an indirect effect of adopting these sorts of technologies. And we got in a sort of situation where the first adopters of the technology increased yields. And as yields went up, 
cost went down. And as cost went down, you had to grow more. And as you had to grow more, you had to adopt more technology. And in order to get that technology, you had to get loans from the bank. And it drove small farmers out of business, which devastated small communities. And we have this grass, graph here where the number of farms goes down, but the size of the farms goes up. But we did pay a cost in the loss of community life. And this loss has been chronicled and argued about by Wendell Berry. I recommend that you read him. But he, he, he takes a very virtue ethics approach to this. He says that these small rural communities following Jefferson, these sort of agrarian <coughs> communities, were sort of incubators for the virtue. They created and helped create a good society where good values that supported our democracy were sort of nurtured. And we've lost something very important in this sort of technological revolution in agriculture and agricultural policies. So utilitarianism did a lot of good, fed a lot of people, but it missed a lot. So what I'm arguing is, unlike sort of Freeman Dyson, that utilitarianism drove the technological revolution. It was a philosophy behind it, much like it was a philosophy behind the Forest Service for many years. However, it led to many problems because of its blindness to individual rights, its blind, uh, blindness to environmental values, its blindness to the importance of rural communities in creating cultures that would lead to a just society. Now that changed. Uh, the change from utilitarianism to sort of a market uh, philosophy driving technological innovation happened in the 80s. Uh, and you get this transformation. And it happened largely during the Reagan administration. And so we get a different philosophy guiding technological advances. So to an important degree, and not all sciences by any means, but certainly biotechnology, intertechnology, and things like nanotechnology. To an important degree, free market morals has replaced utilitarianism as the act that is a driving important areas of science. So a lot of this happened due to a series of laws. And what these laws did is they allowed science to become a real money maker. I think there was a sense that Japan was outdoing us. We were more innovative, but Japan was better at putting this technology and making money out of it. So all of these laws brought big science into the market during this period. One of the most famous is the Bay uh, Dole Patent and Trademark. And that allowed innovations that were publicly funded to be patented and then put into the market to make money. And that changed universities a great deal. So here we are, you know, we're wondering, you know, we have this great innovation of biotech corn, and it's patented, right? And a lot of social problems. Now, a lot of the problems with biotechnology has been over regulation. And that's because it's been brought into the market in science and technology under this sort of philosophical vision. So there's really only a few biotech crops. And they're just a few created for very large crops, soybean, corn, and cotton, which is everything. And it's usually herbicide tolerant, where you can spray Roundup Ready on it, or uh, where it has pesticide in the leaves using a protein from a bacteria. Okay? The problem with that is it ignores a lot of crops that the poor use. So if this technology, and it's arguable we want to go this way, right? People could disagree. But if this technology is going to benefit the many poor people and promote social justice, it's not set up to because of this ethical system. Right? There's this thing known as orphan crops. And these are crops that are largely grown by poor people around the world in, in poor soils. And those aren't, to a much lesser, lesser degree, being experimented on because of this sort of market mechanism driving technology. So a lot of scientists are worried about this. A lot of people go into science because they are very concerned about promoting social justice. And they do believe that science can help do that. And they say the private sector has little incentive to conduct public good type research, such as natural resources, food safety, and basic research. The public sector must continue to take that lead. So you look in areas like biotechnology, the amount of public sector funding is very small in comparison to the private sector funding. And that's a big change in the institution. So if we're asking, is scientific research and technological development promoting social justice, again, you're going to get a variety of answers. 
right? Depends on who you ask. The utilitarian, well, is it maximizing the greatest good for the greatest number? And you've seen there's problems with that approach, right? It has led to many goods, but has created a lot of problems. The free market moral theory, well, are the markets free? But, you know, I, I went to a talk by an executive from DuPont, and he was arguing that DuPont's technology was going to, you know, solve poverty. But it was an indirect effect, right? The benefits that they created for the markets would somehow find their way, you know, into these other, uh, into these poorer groups. The roles in which is not government would ask, is it benefiting the least well-off in society, right? And the virtue theorist is promoting the just or good society. Well, in my opinion, the utilitarian and free market-driven science have a mixed record on social justice. Um, they have proven to have a troubling blindness to important social and environmental values. Uh, more attention needs to be paid to other conceptions of justice. Rawls, for example, in virtue ethics, is drivers of research. This would require a restructuring of research institutions and research priorities. And I might say some of this is happening over the notion of sustainability, as we sort of argue and wonder about what that idea is about. So changing my question of what I think we should be doing as a society, and as uh, UM students with their general education ethics requirement now equipped to go out to discuss these issues, is we should be deliberating together about the relationship between favored conceptions of justice, our shared goals in, in, in relationship to these immensely difficult global problems that we're facing, climate change and, and world hunger and uh, world health or global health, uh, and how to reach those goals using scientific research and technological development, but in light, right? Uh, of our best knowledge about the world. So, as I promised, I would uh, ask these questions but not answer them and leave it up to us to, to now discuss them. Thank you. glad you brought Socrates back. You would have been yeah. upset if you finished with uh, Aristotle. Yeah. <laughs> I love these old guys. Okay, so I, I didn't know them personally. <laughs> okay, so now we have our typical uh, time for questions and answers, and uh, Jay and Susan are going to have microphones. Um, Dane, you may use either this one or that sure. one, and I'll just try to point out to Susan and Jay where I see hands up. How will that be? And they'll bring you a mic. Okay, here's our first question. Right over by Susan. Um, could you please talk a little bit on the first Rawls slide? You, you talked about justice um, with an expectation of entitlement. Yeah. Could you explain that full, more fully, please? Well, that, that's one of the criticisms, right? Uh, Rawls's theory, that it creates this expectations of entitlement, right? That, that um, you know, it is a theory that involves a very active government, right? Uh, and that, as we know, people criticize a very active government for creating this expectation, that they're entitled to something. And I think the, the libertarians then, you know, are the ones arguing against that. Well, you're entitled to what you've got, right? What you work for. And so they, you know, this is the debate that we're having in this society, right? If we get this sort of active government, this sort of Rawlsian vision, and there is a direct connection between Rawls and Obama, right? Uh, he went to Harvard, studied this sort of thing. Uh, and the, there is this worry. So I was just raising that as, as maybe not a problem I might have, but certainly a criticism of the sort of Rawlsian approach. Hello. Hello. My name is Will. I just got back from a uh, three-day summit in Olympia about uh, the uh, western half of the United States Occupy movement. Yeah. I'm curious um, what your opinion of that is, the Occupy movement in general, and I'm very curious what people's um, overall feel for what's going on here in Mon Mon Missoula is because 
Man, did I meet some people this weekend. It was the most exciting thing I've ever done. Yeah. And I would encourage every single one of you, if you give a shit about the questions being asked here, to get involved with Occupy, because this is all it is, this debate. Thank you. Yeah. I'll let some other people here respond to that. But, uh, but I think it's extremely healthy, right? Part of, I think, the point of my talk was that's what we do if we're living in a democratic society well, right? We, you know, we have these different insights on you know, how to shape society that we're working with, right? That I just sort of very briefly introduced. And, I, and it is a philosophical debate on what a good society is, what a just society is. And I see the Occupy movement and the sort of vigorous debate we're having on both sides as a sign of health. Now, remember I put up that Nor Norman Rockwell slide was next to mine. We we're having this calm, you know, civil debate, you know, and everybody's being quiet while everybody speaks. Well, that's not what it looks like, right? It's much messier than that. But I'm okay with it, right? I do, uh, I do, you know, think it's a very healthy sign. And I think these are important issues with huge consequences. And I think uh, one of our missions here at the University of Montana is, is to equip people to move into that argument well, right? Because we know it can go poorly and lead to bad decisions. Right? Um, anybody else want to remark on that? I was worried that I wouldn't get through all my slides, and so I maybe went too quickly. And I had too much time. <laughs> May I just ask you a question? Uh, what do you make? Um, how could how could we uh, think about this decision by the Supreme Court? I think only today well, to review the uh, the Texas. Case about uh, race as a, as a criteria for admission to the University of Texas. Have you heard about that? Sure, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, how would each of these systems sort of approach that question about how you get into the University of Texas? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm, I wasn't prepared for that question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See, that yeah. Just so it's on the, on the mic. That's yeah. not a Oh, the question was that I'm not going to try to tackle because it, I think it's an excellent question that we could all talk about. Was the Supreme Court, I believe, uh, reviewed a decision? Yeah, go ahead. I, I just heard today that the Supreme Court has agreed to review a decision about the uh, appropriateness of race as a criterion for admission into a public university. And I think in 2003 they decided about that. That was when Sandra Day O'Connor was still on the court. Yeah. Now it's quite a different court and there right. people are expecting a somewhat different approach to this. Yeah. And the question is how can race be weighted within other with, along with other criteria. So how would, I mean, my question was, what would the arguments be for this yeah. or against this? Well, what do you guys think? Is this a good idea that they review this? this? What do you think? I mean, this, this, let's hear the argument. You guys have a, yeah. I, I don't know, I was just wondering for myself, but I really don't know much about that. Um, <coughs> the decision they made originally, or are you? Well, well, one of, the, one of the questions is, is, does it violate justice, right? Uh, you know, we are sort of, rep, it is a reparation for past wrong, right? And, you know, each one of these theories of justice would inform how people think about this, right? And the utilitarian, of course, they don't have these sorts of, uh, you know, is this absolutely right or absolutely wrong? Let's look at the consequences, right, of how this might play out. And so they would look at, well, would it promote the greatest good for the greatest number of people? Now, it wouldn't really matter if maybe some people who are equally qualified don't get in, as long as it sort of increases the general welfare, right? If there's a group of people in these reparations, it might increase the overall happiness of everybody. So that's how they might look at it. Well, the libertarians would have a problem with this, <laughs> right? Because they would want it to be done on your merit. Right, if you're going to be put into this, this sort of university system, you should get there based upon your effort. And it should be blind to anything else, right? Uh, with the exception, as long as it was a fair process. But there's all kinds of complications with whether or not it was a fair process, right? That, that could be discussed about, you know, in terms of this. So there were, you know, I think the libertarians would, would probably not be happy with this, but there would be room for argument, right? 
Now, the Rawlsian would not have a problem <laughs> in this sense that if these people are from a disadvantaged group, right, and we could ask ourselves this question, would this, this sort of policy, right, benefit the least well-off in society? And if we could say yes to that, well, then, yeah, we could move forward with this policy, right? Um, so, you know, those are at least a few answers. Right, of how that might play out, but I, I think it would be a, you know, it would be an interesting question. But it, it's a deep question of justice, where these sorts of these sorts of conversations and discussions will happen. My point is, much of them will be based on these kinds of theories that we've introduced. Right, uh, they will perform the sort of vocabulary. Yeah. Yes. We got we got one right here. Oh, I see. Um, seems to me that American society is very much about property rights. I mean, that's yes, the basis. Is. So, um, given that fact, how do you get people to talk about social justice? I mean, this is like two sides of um, Berlin Wall or something. Yeah. You know, in relationship, if I could take it back to talking about technologies, is that is one of the big questions about technological advancement, right? That for example, you saw the corn with the patent on it, right? The guy's eating his corn. And, and the general idea is there that the motivation for innovation, right? It, it's very much, you know, the, the sort of property rights is a motivational thing, right? If you give people property and you allow them to be unrestricted, they'll do something with it. And we'll all sort of benefit from that. So one of the, the ideas here is it's motivational, right? That's, that's the theory, right? I see so you're skeptical, but that's the theory. Uh, if we move into te technologies, this sort of changing regime in technology, which I said we went from this sort of utilitarian, utilitarian phrase in the post-World War II big science to the post-80s, you know, we get this sort of free market idea. The idea was that we're going to get these innovations because of patents. If we move it into the market and we make it profitable, we'll get people doing this, right? And they're going to spin out these innovations. And they're going to you know, lead to these sorts of things that we'll all benefit from. But there is problems with that in terms of social justice. And we can see it in health medicine, right? <clears throat> we have this sort of you know, free enterprise medical system that's generated you know, wonderful drugs, some of which we don't need, some of which are fantastic. But those drugs, because of the patent system, have a hard way finding it to some people who really need them. They simply don't have the money. And so the, that's a deficit with this model working towards social justice. And it could be the same thing, and that was the point I made with biotechnology. If we have this sort of property rights motivation, the sort of ability to have patent is driving motivation because of it will give you wealth, which will motivate you to innovate, there is a problem because many of these innovations won't find their way <coughs> to where they're needed. Climate change is an extremely important example of this. You know, we could have lots of innovative energy technologies, but where these energy technologies are where poor people are and where poor people need to develop economically. So if they can't afford these technologies, then they'll be using cheap coal, right? We had, during the economic collapse, uh, our speaker last week was talking about this, there's a little dip in carbon output during the economic collapse when our economy sort of slowed down. We quit putting up carbon. Then it went up really fast. But the economy hadn't really recovered. Well, what happened is people switched to cheaper forms of carbon-intensive fuel. And that's what's going to happen with India. And that is what's happening with China. So if you know the free market sort of patenting of energy technology could be a barrier to this. So that's why in climate change, an essential sort of ethical issue is technological transfer. Right, given the sort of free market regime we have. Did that shed any insight? Yeah, we could go on all night about that. Yeah. Well, I think we should go on all night because I think there was, I was listening to this show on uh, Charlie Rose last night. And they talked about presidents, right? You happen to see that. And how they set the discourse, right? And they said the discourse on this free market was set during the Reagan administration. And it really hasn't changed since, right? <clears throat> And, uh, and perhaps that's an important conversation in light of some of the problems, in, in, at least in this talk, that technology and getting the technology to promote social justice. Right? So it's an important conversation. Right? Who back here owns the microphone? Oh, there he is. 
uh, since we all agree that uh, our Earth has uh, finite resources, yes. uh, couldn't we argue that uh, the findings of uh, big science are uh, simply uh, prolonging our eventual demise? Yeah. Yeah, well, that was Garrett Hardin's point, right? That we're all still in this lifeboat, right? Uh, that may be the case. I don't know. Uh, but, but like I said, for me, in terms of social justice, personally, that raises a lot of problems, right? I think that Garrett Hardin and his sort of lifeboat ethics, in my sense of social justice, really conflict, right? Um, and so I see some hope in that graph, and that was part of the point of my talk, is that graph that development does, you know, people start, you know, they quit having as many kids, right? Uh, and that is the case in the United States. I mean, I'm getting ready to think about putting my son through college, and I'm glad I only had two kids. <laughs> you know, if I had any more, I'd never retire, right? And so the general idea is that poverty does drive, to a large degree, population growth. And, and I don't agree with Freeman Dyson on a lot of things, but he does see hope in somehow this development curve if people become wealthy. Uh, now, this also presents a problem of can everybody become wealthy with these other things? So, you know, I, I, I really say we've got a lot of problems. <laughs> uh, and part of the point of this talk is technology, you know, may have some answers. But given the sort of ethics that's driving technology now, will those answers actually help us to the degree that they need to? Right. If, uh, if I could follow up on that. Absolutely. Just, uh, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> what, uh, uh, what assurance do we have that that leveling off will occur before the carrying capacity of the planet has been reached? Uh, not much. <laughs> I think it's a hope. Uh, you know, I'm, I've, went to, I've been to talks by people who div do demographics and read the articles. I am no expert. But I think the hope, at least in that graph that I showed, was that in developing countries, or developed countries, it has leveled off, right? So if you look at places like Spain, Italy, the U.S., if it wasn't for immigration, population growth has leveled off, right? And so I, I, I think there is a hope that the pattern would continue. But I don't think there's any guarantee. Right. We're, we're driving this ship and it's out of control. <laughs> uh, right over there in front of you, Jay. And I'd like to ask you a more systemic question. Sure. Since you've approached then social justice from the side of ethics, mm -hmm. Plato famously said that if you try to do that, you won't get anywhere. And you must not look at questions of justice in the small, which is ethics. Sure. You have to look at them in terms of then the larger arrangement. And he gave us Plato's Republic. Sure. Now, since we're in Plato's house, he did, after all, found the academy, it seems to me rather odd that one should simply miss out all those thinkers who have been in the Platonic tradition. And in reference to the last speaker, it seems very clear to me that the primary concern, which is out there, as it were, in the, in the ambient air of values in which we live, is the one, then, uh, of a sustainable society. Sure. And the sense in which, then, ethics that were uh, put together without a thought, but they weren't <coughs> facing omnicide and uh, ecocide and perhaps now econocide in the way that we are, which fuels this sense that we must look to a sustainable society. It seems to me we are back with Plato's problem. We better fix the big picture first, see things clearly in the large. And I think it's inappropriate in these circumstances to give such emphasis to the approach to society from the side of ethics, to look at the large in terms of first figuring out the small. Well, I'm not sure you're ever going to be happy with my answer, but I'll give it a stab. <laughs> you know, uh, Socrates is up there, right? Uh, he's the sort of patron saint of this talk. And I don't know if that's because it's a cop-out, but I'm claiming Socratic ignorance here. <laughs> In other words, I'm not claiming I have the answers to these. And you know that all of Plato's dialogues were with Socrates. Now, you get into the later dialogues with the Republic, and you wonder if that's still Socrates and, or it's all Plato, right? But Socrates, you know, claimed ignorance. 
And he didn't claim to have the answers. And like I said, this may be a cop-out, but I don't claim to. But he did claim to want to stimulate discussion, right? And he had this notion of Socratic midwifery, right? That, that his goal was to try to give birth to ideas, right? Um, or another metaphor he used for himself was a gadfly, where he would be like, you know, the, the city of Athens is a great horse, and his job was be, to be a fly to buzz around it and keep it from becoming complacent, right? And so I think the, the idea of this talk was more or less to frame certain sorts of questions, not to supply the answers, because I don't think anybody would listen to me if I had the answers. <laughs> Uh, I, I am bowing to the process that we have. And we have this process that we're going through, which is very messy. Uh, like, uh, you know, and I said I applaud, you know, the Occupy Wall Street movement because they're stimulating a discussion on important issues. And the Tea Party movement, they're stimulating discussions on important issues. And we have this messy process of going back and forth, trying to figure out what to do and how to organize our society. Now, my goal as a teacher, and what I attempted to do here, is to try to help this process become a little clear <laughs> and become a little sane <laughs> in the idea that we're more educated about it. And that's why I said this, this is the sort of general education requirement, is that when people move into these discussions, they may reject roles, but they have to appreciate roles. This sort of liberal conception that we need to be concerned about the least off in our society and that it makes sense to because he's given a good argument for that position. Now, you may reject him, but you just don't flip him you know, out of hand. Or you may reject libertarianism, but you have to appeal to the power of that philosophy as it arose in the 19th century, when people were living in a very restricted life. Right? I mean, if you were a woman in the 19th century, you were glad to see libertarian come around, because your life was restricted. Right? So I think we can appreciate these things and have an intelligence discussion about it, rather than yelling at each other. I think, you know, that's what an education is about, right? Yes? Okay. Um, can, in the issue of sustainability, um, the long historical uh, context of human history has been a, a, a major rush of adventurism sure. and claiming of free rights. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is it possible to, to frame a discussion about free rights, property rights, um, without also um, talking about obligations. Uh, yeah. The human species being the sole keepers of the planet, don't sure. we have obligations? And so it's something that's, that you never hear about. Mm -hmm. And that in the belief system, uh, do we ever talk about our obligations um, right. to uh, keep rather than use? Yeah, that's some really good points. No, I think your comments are, are excellent. Um, you know, that's what I was thinking, you know, in terms of this notion of sustainability. And I, I'm glad you brought it up. It's a really confused notion, isn't it? I mean, it can mean a lot to a different people, a lot of different people. In fact, we had a philosopher here who's written volumes on it a few weeks ago. And I said, well, you know, why didn't you give up on sustainability? A lot of people just dismissed the idea. And he goes, no, it's an important idea. All of these ideas, like justice. You know, we're not going to jettison that idea, even though it's complex and we have these different theories and lots of people talking about it. But I think it's important that this notion comes into our public discourse, right? And then we start talking about it and what it means. And I threw that slide of Wendell Berry up there, right, about agrarianism and the importance of small rural societies. And uh, this other philosopher who was here visiting uh, talked about these importance of these agrarian virtues. But he goes, you know, agrarianism just doesn't ream with the younger generation nowadays, right? Doesn't motivate people. But I, I was thinking about what he said, and I think this notion of sustainability might be arising. Because you get sustainability connected to the local foods, the way we grow food, our obligations to land. And you start seeing some of the agrarian themes and some virtues associated with living a sustainable lifestyle. Maybe we're seeing a sort of notion that'll move into our political and our discourse that might capture a lot of these ideas. And you also see within science a lot of notions of how do we use science to create a sustainable society? Is biotechnology actually going to help us achieve a sustainable society, or is it going to work against it? Right. And so I think uh, I think this notion of sustainability you point to 
with its notions of obligations and virtues that might be associated with, you know, is hopeful, I think, that we can sort of bring these ideas into our public discourse around this idea, just like many of these important ideas got brought into our, or were brought into our discourse over the notion of justice, right? And, we, and it's going to be confused, but that's okay. I mean, we're people. <laughs> we're confused. <laughs> You're, you're setting off a lot of thoughts for me. I really I, I appreciate the discussion. I do want to say to everyone here, I have an opinion that it is your duty to be in dialogue with your citizens, and everyone in this room should be participating in the Occupy movement or debates along these lines with the people you know and love. That said, I do have a specific question sure. for you um, along the lines of how do you feel? Uh, I feel like Jeremy Bentham ran very... That, that line of thought right, ben, ran very strong in your um, presentation. I studied architecture in college, and I'm curious what, how you feel about his idea of the Panopticon, Foucault's study of that, and the current role of internet and video reproduction of human beings in yeah. today's media. It, well, you know, if, if it came out that I'm a fan of Jeremy Bentham, I'm not. <laughs> But I do want to acknowledge that that sort of utilitarian movement, you know, did capture something that really bought into things. I think during, you know, there was a utilitarian movement and it gave us things like public health, right? If you're going to promote the greatest good for the greatest number, you know, plop a hospital down, you know, get a sewage system, right? And so these became very progressive ideas for a long period of time that led to a lot of social goods. And I think Pinchot, you know, he's been villainized a little bit, but I think he did a lot of good. You look at, you know, the way uh, the world was before he took over, uh, and, you know, you know, the greatest good for the greatest number did a lot of good. Now, on that, I mean, part of my talk was that there's a lot of crazy ideas. I mean, if you read Bentham, the Panopticon, right, uh, this sort of... You know, this idea in a, in a prison house, if you have a person in a tower where you can't see them, that that's going to sort of govern people's behavior, right? Sort of a creepy idea, right? Uh, the fact that we only look to consequences bothers me. I think there are some things that are just wrong, right? I sort of am a true believer in human rights. And, uh, and utilitarians aren't. They look at the consequences. And also they reduce people to... Uh, pleasure seekers and pain avoiders. I think there's much more to us than that. Right? Uh, and so I think there's a lot of problems with Bentham. But I think he really influenced our society, right? And the internet, and you know, I'm not sure where to go with that. But I think these strains are still there, right? And, and part of my idea was, you know, just reviewing, I guess, what I said was the greatest good for the greatest number is still, you know, highly influential in the way we look at the world. I didn't answer your question, but I could. Can I, can I reword it? Sure. Um, do you feel that everyone in this room agrees on hundreds and thousands of things that we could be doing differently, and that the only reason they aren't is that if they feel like they rise up, if they create a little news, we live in a country ruled by a domestic army and a corrupt media, and if you mess with it in any way, they can take away your life, the surveillance is there, the technology that is there, and the, for, for the first time in human history, every person in this room, whether or not they're being surveilled, is aware or, or has some psychological phenomenon going on in which if you rise up, if you challenge things, your private life is over. The, the things about you between mm -hmm. pleasure seeking and pain avoidance those can be stripped of you very easily. Your private life, the things you really believe in, can very easily be taken away from you. What is your, your intuitive gut feel of that psychological phenomenon in relation to the need for a social movement today? I think that question was harder than the first one. <laughs> <laughs> now, I appreciate what you're saying, but I don't know if I could feel it. One, I couldn't hazard a guess where we're folks are coming from. But I do appreciate what you're saying. I do think... Uh, you know, there is this sort of worry. Uh, but I, I really couldn't feel that one. But I appreciate you getting it out on the table, right? Uh, yes? 
some first-hand experience. I'm an architect from the Bitterroot Valley. I sat on the county planning board for three years, tried to promote values of, uh, of why we should uh, uh, be engaging a world plan, uh, world resource assessment, an understanding of how much uh, resource there is and how we're consuming it. And, and what I found was uh, I stood on the street with my son and, um, you know, it, it got so scary that I had to back out. So after I, my book was published, um, I went on a concerted effort to promote sustainability in our communities. Mm -hmm. The Bitterroot community and the Missoula community are inextricably entwined with the water system. What are we going to do? And the real fundamental question of the, what I promote is, when are we going to just ask the question? And the question has never been thrown on the table. Um, that's a very basic question, and the question is, what for? Yeah. What, what, what is it for? And so with the scramble to dominate the planet, we have belief systems that are horribly steeped in superstition, magic, mojo. Uh, we teach our children to be afraid. You know, what's up with all these things? Yeah. Where's, where's, where's the question? So, you're indeed right. And you, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank you very much. That was a great uh, lecture. And I think I'm in the medical field, yeah. and it seems that uh, much of what's discussed is apropos to the current yeah. thinking in uh, healthcare systems. Yeah. Uh, greatest good for the greatest number or uh, greatest innovations in medicine are actually part of the market system where uh, yeah. innovations are being created that uh, everybody cannot afford. And I'd like to ask you, uh, what, what is your impression as to the administration and how they're uh, looking at uh, trying to form a medical system that uh, yeah. That, that they would agree with. You know, it's tough going, isn't it? The, the sort of utilitarian and free market approach is very much entrenched. Um, and, you know, I don't know if I could comment exactly, you know, on, uh, on you know, our current administration. I don't think I have enough knowledge to give you, you know, a clear answer. But, you know, I'm glad that you feel the question, <laughs> you know, and you sense it. Um, but I do think, you know, they are trying to bring these ideas in, right? These other Rawlsian, you know, will these things benefit, right? These technologies, the least well off in the system. How do we get the technology there? I know there was a philosopher that we invited here about a year ago, I think, uh, Thomas Poton. And I don't know if you've, you happen to come to his talks. But he's, uh, he's talking about um, global health. And he recognizes the fact that we have all of these fantastic medicines. They would help millions of people, but they just can't afford them or get to them. And here's a philosopher, I found him really inspiring, because he, he's come up with a way to use Rawlsian principles to create a market mechanism that would allow for this to happen. Right? And so he wants to create, and I don't remember the details right, but I thought it was a very provocative idea. His name's Thomas Pogge, and I can give you the references. But he talked about an idea of where we use a different measurement for rewarding companies. So instead of rewarding a company on how much money they make, we reward a company on health benefits. So in other words, if you come up with a technology and it, it benefits you know, the least well off, of course the motivation, if you could come up with a technology and you have you know, thousands or millions of people living in the developing world that would receive a, um, a uh, uh, you know, a medical benefit from it, and he has this health index, then you would be rewarded for that, right? Rewarded for the change in public health that your technology created, right? And in order to, to create that, he, he said all the countries need to go in and create a global health fund, right? So we all kind of go together and say, well, this is a good idea. We're going to use these sort of market mechanisms to create innovation that would get the technology where it needs to be to the people that need to have it. And so everybody goes in, and the US, of course, would be a big contributor to this global health fund. And if your technology created a tremendous benefit, then you would be rewarded for the change in actual health it had. 
And that, that, those ideas I found really attractive. Right? So I, I know that didn't answer your question. Uh, I, I just don't have the knowledge, right? I know they're trying, <laughs> giving it an effort. Uh, you want to have a comment on that? I'd like to hear what you have to say. You, you know, rather than, oh, go ahead, somebody else. I just wanted to ask you, in that, in that, in that view, is it a monetary reward? Is that yeah, it is a monetary reward. Yeah. And that's what, it's very expensive, you know, to create, yeah. Besides monetary reward. Yeah, would be. Well, I mean, I'm a professor, so I don't live there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I saw some people getting up. Yeah. Um, I think it's almost time for us to go, but I do want, before we leave, if you are one of our speakers in this series and you're here tonight, would you please stand up? <laughs> Get back in here, Rebecca. Okay, so we have Dick Barrett, who is going to be on in two weeks. We have Rebecca Bendick, who's going to be on next week. We have Daisy Rooks, who is on the week after that, I believe. So thank you all for coming, because we really like this kind of address. Thank you. Thank you.